Hello and welcome to Ask the Expert, a webinar series brought to you by the Children's Tumor Foundation. CTF's mission is to drive research, expand knowledge, and advance care for the NF community. This new series is helping us pursue that mission by expanding knowledge about NF. Every month we invite speakers to discuss a variety of topics relevant to living with NF, and those videos are then made available to you here on our website. What's more exciting is that for two weeks after a video is posted, you can submit questions to that expert that will later be shared and answered on our site. This project will be hosted by me, Kate Kelts. I am a registered nurse with over a decade of NF experience. I've been with the foundation since 2014, and I am excited to bring this opportunity to our amazing NF community. Today, we will be discussing the differences between the three types of NF. NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis. This information was developed by Heather Radke, the NF Clinic Network Coordinator for the Children's Tumor Foundation, in cooperation with Pam Knight, our Director of Clinical Programs. It was also reviewed and approved by a member of our Medical Advisory Board. The information that's provided to you is meant to be a primer and is certainly not comprehensive. The aim being a basic understanding of the differences between these three different but related conditions. Thank you so much for joining me today. First, we're going to take a look at the basics. The most basic differences between the three types of NF, um, we're going to start with how a diagnosis is made. In NF1, we have specific diagnostic criteria, which is true for each of the conditions. NF1 is generally a clinical diagnosis, which means it's made based on what the doctor sees when they look at a patient. This can be based on skin findings, like the cafe au lait spots and freckling, eye findings that include optic gliomas, benign tumors that can grow on the back of the eye, on the nerve behind the eye, Lish nodules, which are like freckles in the colored part of the eye, it can also involve various types of tumors, bone deformities, or a family history of NF1. In NF2, diagnosis is most often made based on the criteria of um, various types of tumors, juvenile cataracts, or family history. In schwannomatosis, clinical criteria includes, again, types of tumors and a family history. The incidence of each condition is pretty different. In NF1, we see 1 in 3,000 live births, and half of these are what we call spontaneous, meaning there is no family history. The other half are inherited from a first-degree relative, meaning a parent. In NF2, we see about 1 in 25,000. Half of these are also spontaneous, the other half inherited, similar to NF1. In schwannomatosis, we estimate approximately 1 in 40,000 live births are affected by schwannomatosis. About 15% of these cases are inherited. The age of onset for each condition is a little different. In NF1, we often can make a diagnosis as early as infancy, and we expect to be able to do it at least by early childhood. There are, of course, exceptions to this. In NF2, it is often diagnosed anywhere from late childhood through early adulthood. In schwannomatosis, it is largely diagnosed in adults. In each case, in each condition, we see tumors, and the, which is one way that they are related, but these types of tumors are very different. In NF1, we see cutaneous neurofibromas. These are benign, meaning not cancerous tumors that can increase in number over time. They are the little lumps and bumps that you can see on or underneath the skin in someone with NF1. There are various ways to treat these, and people often see them as a significant cosmetic frustration in NF1. We also see plexiform neurofibromas. These are the larger tumors that, while benign, will continue often to grow as someone grows themselves. Um, that tumor can continue to get larger over time. It can make surgery very difficult. And there is a risk of a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, shorthand MPNST, which is something that anyone with NF1, and particularly with NF1 and a plexiform neurofibroma needs to be monitored for. This is the type of tumor that the latest drug that we're calling the MEK inhibitor has shown promising um, results for treating this tumor and stopping and reversing its growth. We also see optic gliomas in NF1. 
These are benign tumors also. They grow on the nerve behind the eye. They're seen in early childhood in children seven or younger, and they occasionally need treatment, even chemotherapy, but this differs a lot from one child to the next. In some cases, no treatment is needed, and they can even shrink and go away on their own. Other types of tumors seen less often, but certainly related with NF1, are gliomas of other kinds, um, gastrointestinal stromal tumors, leukemias, pheochromocytoma, and a few others that are not listed here. In NF2, we see vestibular schwannomas, which are also referred to as acoustic neuromas. These can cause hearing and balance issues, as well as tinnitus, which is ringing in the ear. Depending on the timing of surgery, it's many people may benefit from a cochlear implant or auditory brainstem implant because these tumors will eventually cause a loss of hearing. NF2, we also can see schwannomas, meningiomas, and gliomas growing in the central nervous system. In schwannomatosis, we often see schwannomas, which is a type of tumor. And these are specifically schwannomas that do not affect hearing or that vestibular nerve. That is one way that we can differentiate in, between an NF2 diagnosis and a schwannomatosis diagnosis. Sometimes surgery can help with these tumors, but they cause often a lot of pain for patients, and surgery may not relieve that pain. The risk of malignancy in NF1, um, the highest, most significant risk would be plexiform neurofibromas that convert to those malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. They also have an increased risk of breast cancer and other types of malignancies. In NF2 and schwannomatosis, malignancy is very, very rare. The main concerns in each condition are pretty different. In NF1, we are going to see functional concerns that can be related to those bone deformities or large tumors that are growing and affecting the function of the body. There are also significant cosmetic concerns as the tumors will grow and cause um, deformities that are very difficult for people to live with. We also look for malignancy, as well as in NF1, we see the risk of learning disabilities in children, which is something that we want to watch out for. In NF2, we're looking at functional issues. Again, um, the tumors that are growing on that vestibular nerve will cause hearing loss, balance issues, and that can be a, a really significant life-altering situation for people living with NF2, of course. In schwannomatosis, the main concern for patients, what usually brings them to the doctor and leads to a diagnosis, is chronic pain. Life expectancy in each case is variable, but we do expect some reduction in life expectancy for patients living with one of these conditions. Genetic testing for NF1 is getting better all the time. We can currently say with confidence that we can detect uh, greater than 95% of patients with NF1 with the test that we are using. It's a simple blood test. It can also be done with saliva, saliva or a sample of a tumor. Um, it cannot detect all cases and it can't rule out NF. What this means is that if you have blood sent because they're suspecting NF1 or any of these conditions and it comes back negative, a doctor may choose to still follow you for further observation to see if any other symptoms of one of these conditions develop because we simply can't use the test to completely rule out a diagnosis. Um, in NF2, our testing is predicting about 60 to detecting about 60 to 70 percent, uh, but testing is complicated by mosaicism in NF2, and so that can be a challenge. Um, genetic testing for schwannomatosis is simply not yet well defined. Testing can be quite expensive. It's not always covered by insurance, and it rarely, with some exceptions in NF1, can predict the severity of condition, meaning that we don't have a way to use genetic testing to tell us the prognosis or the long-term risks that someone living with NF1 or NF2 is, is looking at. Um, genetics and inheritance in NF1 we know is autosomal dominant, meaning that it's inherited from a parent. It's extremely variable, so a parent who is relatively healthy with an NF1 diagnosis could have a child that has extreme or very significant health complications, or the reverse of that is also possible. It affects The mutation affects chromosome 17, the NF1 gene that makes neurofibromin protein. In NF2, it is also autosomal dominant, also extremely variable. It affects chromosome 22. The NF2 gene makes the Merlin protein. 
And in schwannomatosis, knowing again that it's autosomal dominant, but decreased penetrance may cause it to appear to skip a generation. This means that a person may have the mutation, but with no signs or symptoms, appears to be unaffected, but can still pass it on and have a child with the condition. Let's move on. If you have more questions about the genetics of one of these conditions, I strongly suggest you speak to your provider or see a genetic counselor who can walk you through your specific diagnosis and helping you to understand your own risks or risks for future children and family planning. Um, it's a really good idea for anyone living with one of these conditions. In NF1, we have a few other findings that we see pretty commonly. We often see um, a large head size called macrocephaly. It can be on the shorter side. You can also see hypertension. This hypertension is sometimes related to a renal artery stenosis or something called pheochromocytoma. So blood pressure checks are important for kids and adults with NF1. They also can have a variety of cardiovascular issues. So that is also something to be keeping an eye on. In NF2, we can see facial weakness, um, dry eyes or foot drop related to some of the to the tumor that they can develop on that vestibular nerve. In NF1, we see 50% of uh, children with learning disabilities, approximately 5% with more significant impairments, ADHD or social difficulties. This is an area that is still actively being researched, so we can find better information and in how to help kids with NF1 to feel and be successful. We do not see a relation between an NF2 or schwannomatosis diagnosis and any kind of learning difficulties. NF1 is affected by hormone shifts of adolescence and pregnancy. Often someone with NF1 will see an increase in cutaneous neurofibromas during these times of life where hormones are shifting quite a bit, but it's not something that's known in NF2 or schwannomatosis. Thank you so much for joining us today for Ask the Expert. Please remember to submit any questions you may have and check back in two weeks for those questions with their answers to be posted here. Together, we will see an end to NF.